Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Denis Uyanik and I am a PACP registered uh, psychotherapist and I'm a PhD candidate uh, in New York College Athens. And today I have Mr. Dimitris Siakos, mm -hmm. psychologist, psychologist, my actually my previous supervisor when I was getting my CBT training. And Mr. Chiakos is also clinical director of Institute of Contemporary Psychotherapy in Athens. Mm -hmm. ICPA, yeah. And ICPA. And I would encourage anyone to go to ICPA's website, icpa.gr, to see uh, the content and trainings. There are many events and many things are happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And today I wanted to talk with Mr. Shakos about psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. For and I must also say this is the first event that we are going to do uh, with a mental health cafe for the New York College uh, YouTube uh, channel, and we are hoping to bring more topics like this. Uh, part of the conversation is going to happen. Yes, our students uh, are really interested within the topics, but this will also be available publicly. So therefore I will do my best to take the position of someone that is just interested in this and ask questions in that way, rather than try to go into really super deep and super technical uh, points. Mm -hmm. Before we start, is there anything that you wanted to say anything we, uh, you wanted to comment us on before uh, we because I'm I have so many questions that I could go in and I could start yeah. asking them or if you have any comments or anything that you want to share with our students feel free well, I'm very happy to be here <laughs> to be the first uh, meeting on mental care cafe in New York, I'm uh, uh, cooperating many years with New York College as a lecturer, so I have mm -hmm. uh, presented some courses and uh, as Denis say, a, a lot of years I'm supervisor at the placement mainly of New York College uh, uh, classes. Uh, I'm line manager at the master of New York College about psychotherapy and counseling and positive psychology. And uh, um, uh, the previous year I present with Mission's version of the applied experience uh, module on the undergraduate. So usually I have, I think I am familiar with the trainees of the students of New York College. And I know that uh, you are taking psychology very seriously as a department and as a course and as a way of living. So mm -hmm. I think today, we will discuss some things about uh, psychoanalysis in daily life, in a way. I mean, how we can apply basic, simple psychoanalytic mm -hmm. thoughts, classical and contemporary perspectives of psychoanalysis in daily life. I think this will be a good thing for the students. But I'm waiting your responses and your questions and your participation as well. Okay. Psychoanalysis can mean many things, mm. but... I believe there is a psychoanalytic theory founded by Freud, right? Mm -hmm. can, you, can you help us understand what is this? What is psychoanalytic theory? Yeah, in simple words, uh, psychoanalysis is a therapeutic approach. There are other psychotherapeutic approaches as well, but psychoanalysis is a main psychotherapeutic approach that is based on unconscious procedures. We have conscious, and unconscious. Uh, and the unconscious, in a way, gives all the necessary elements for understanding our enactments. What enactment means, this terminology we have to understand. Enactment is when I'm not able to verbalize some psychological things, mm -hmm. so I'm acting on that. For example, uh, let, let's, say, let's create an example. Uh, in a student, I, I will use you. Uh, uh, subsequently, a student uh, does not like the teacher mm -hmm. and has not the power, has not the feeling, has not the desire to confront directly the teacher. He can be late, delay all the time. This is an enactment. Hmm. He or she says things by not verbally saying things. So, shock analysis is the understanding, the exploring of the unconscious. We have defense mechanism, 
the way that we are protecting, in quote, the word protecting, our psychological self, but these defensive mechanisms always, uh, at the long term, provoke a lot of problems. For example, let me give you an example. A defensive mechanism is, uh, how can I say it, the emotional isolation, mm -hmm. meaning that the emotions that I cannot handle This is a very common thing eh, for a lot of people. Mm. I can't handle my emotions, so I isolate. I'm reacting uh, cognitively, rationally. I rationalize a lot. I'm always finding an excuse. I'm always finding the reason to do something. But emotionally, uh, things are very different. So psychoanalysis, let's summarize, has the unconscious develops the exploration of the unconscious, help people understand themselves, and of course, as the common sense knows in a way, psychoanalysis occupies a lot with complex, complex complicated things, complex things, internally mental things of people. Um, occupies a lot with parents, with the, uh, the early age of the people, of uh, Uh, at the way that we grew up, the traumas, the traumas that we used to be provoked by the parents, and the way that you we are reengaged, reenact traumas in the adulthood, and a lot of things like that. Hmm. So, here's how I understand: there are things that we can control. We know we make decisions yeah. in every moment. So I'm holding my cup and I'm drinking. This is a yeah. conscious decision. Yeah, yeah. And then there are things that I react without realizing it. And mm -hmm. this is very simplified way, I understand. But for example, I might be really anxious at this moment, maybe thinking this event, what I'm going to do, maybe I am unconsciously uh, reacting in this way. Exactly. For example, what uh, you are drinking your coffee or something like mm -hmm. that, at the first level, Not surfacely, but at the first level, yes, you have the need uh, to drink something. You are discussing, you are talking a lot. You need uh, for the throat to, to mm -hmm. get some liquid, etc., etc. Okay, this is the first level analysis. Mm -hmm. At the second level, underlying that, why do you, why your unconscious, not your conscious, Denise, why your unconscious choose that moment to drink? What does have to do with the momentum? For example. Let me just say for the students a simple, a simple thing. For example, always, uh, my dear colleagues, the, the oral fixation, the, the oral stage, mm -hmm. at the developmental stages of Freud, the oral stage has some links with caring, take care of, need uh, to digest something, need to get something inside. It's something that link, is linked with the breast in a way, the feeding of the breast. So... Probably the unconscious of Denise, a random example, not exactly. Mm -hmm. The unconscious of Denise uh, wanted to demonstrate something about care. Now I have mm -hmm. to take care of you more, to discuss more. Uh, I have to take care of something with another way to say that something different. I don't know, a lot of different perspectives and examples. But me as, as a psychologist that I'm working psychoanalytically, I have to understand that something is happening with a glass. Mm. What is happening, it's, it is to be analyzed further, of course. But I'm quoting the sense that something is happening there. If it was a therapy, of course, not now, as an example. Okay. So, an application of psychoanalysis is mm. looking deeper of meanings of behaviors and meanings of what how we interact with the world the way that I understand. So if I'm holding my coffee and I keep drinking it, maybe I can't talk, I'm anxious. Maybe there was something from my childhood where I'm not aware of, which was creating a block, creating a problem for me. So exactly. without realizing it, I am using this uh, coffee or mm -hmm. using this medium in a way that acting what happened to me or things from the past, and this is unconsciously. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Probably in a session, if we can assimilate a session in a way, uh, if uh, you decided uh, you're unconscious, uh, 
Mm-hmm. I really decided to drink coffee in a momentum, in a moment specific. Probably into that moment, the content of our words, what we were saying, was something triggering uh, very dangerously for you. You were uh, remembering something from the past or we were exploring something that was very difficult for you. So probably, and only probably, um, the cup that you used, it was a barrier to me. It was like a sign, like a message sending to me, Dimitri, don't speak more, give me a break. Mm. Or something else, but something there is there. Mm. There was one thing when I was working as a, a trainee in, in your center, uh, there was a young secretary. I think she was also uh, studying psychology. Mm-hmm. And I I used to stand next to her. Mm-hmm. And then there there was a, another service that was working with children. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I was I just told her one day, have you noticed once parents bring their children inside the therapy room, every time they come out, they use the hand sanitizer. Mm, exactly. So in a way, I know there are problems, but I have given to you, and I, it's like a reenactment of relief. Mm-hmm. And then she said... Or Bodish Pilatum, you mean? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. So in a way, one application of psychoanalysis in life, in daily life, I mean, yeah. outside of the therapy room, it's looking for meaning or mm-hmm. in a way, looking for the reason why The question why. But also, this sounds so complicated, isn't it? Because Mm. my experiences shaped how I see the world. And the way that I react is possibly unique to me. So anything that I do in order to really analyze it, a person has to kind of look deeper and understand the whole context yeah Mm. it is very very complicated and not only that Denise regardless of the complication it is a scary procedure scary what do I mean we we have if we want to work with ourselves we have to, to explore deeply ourselves and this procedure of exploration demands a lot of internal effort demands to understand some things that we have had and demands to see our parents and our mates around partners with a whole different perspective after some sessions mm. to get rid of the idealization that we used to have for them, to get rid of the excuses that we were given to them for bad behaviors or abusive behaviors, etc., etc., a lot of stuff. So it's hard for the people that are doing psychotherapy, especially psychoanalytically based psychotherapy, it's very hard for them to, how can I say, to not not only to understand what is happening to their life, but more on about understanding. It's to, to be able to see really who their parents are or who their friends are. This is very difficult. This is a demanding procedure that we are not doing in our daily lives. In our daily lives, we are usually say yes, that he is good, he is bad, he helps me, he does not. Uh, I'm feeling uh, neglected, I feel abandoned. Uh, we are more confident in our daily life that we are right. But when we are under therapy, we understand that we are not right. And you know, this is the difficult, very difficult place, psycho- psychotherapeutic place. Uh, Klein, Melanie Klein uh, was a very well-known psychoanalyst with a lot of uh, books and uh, wonderful papers. Uh, she was telling that the um, maturity in psychotherapy in when uh, you are understanding that there are no black or white zones, but there are gray zones. Hmm. And the majority of life is uh, happening in the gray zone. Well, I mean, when you understand that it's very difficult to see who is right and who is wrong, that both are right, both are wrong at the same time. In other words, the maturity comes when you understand the perspective of the other and not yours only. And this is a very complicated, as you said, thing, because before therapy, 
all the clients were thinking that they were right mm. in life. They were the one that they knew everything, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But after therapy, you understand that you are wrong too and right at the same time. So there is an ambivalence. There's an mm. ambivalence. This ambivalence is with you all the time in psychotherapy. And you doubt. You doubt about a lot of things. Eh? Doubting is the cornerstone of the science. No, we have to doubt for a lot of things in order to explore. And you know, in uh, especially in uh, these days, there is no room for doubting to the daily lives. Nobody doubts. Everybody thinks that it's right or wrong, politically, ideology, etc., etc. So this is a very rare thing that we, we are trying in the psychotherapy to persuade people to prepare themselves to be wrong. And this is a strange thing to happen if you are not used on that in your daily life. And so in a way, what you're telling me is the actual analysis mm -hmm. it's in a way person finds themselves relationship to related to themselves related to society mm -hmm. friends what they do and most of the time they have to realize unpleasant things and i wonder mm -hmm. probably therapists are this ambivalence you're talking like this ambivalence is some type of aggression, I suppose, or reaction. So this ambivalence mm -hmm. towards therapists must be quite uh, harsh as well. Imagine that you are figuring out things and you don't like and they're coming out. And mm -hmm. uh, perhaps therapist becomes the target of that aggression, that ambivalence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the contemporary perspective of analysis, the contemporary psychoanalysis uh, or the, co the contemporary relational analysis, the same thing with mm -hmm. other words. What we're doing in our institute too, we train people to mm -hmm. contemporary psychoanalysis. The, the core of the exploration is the relational pattern. In other words, we are very uh, focused to the patterns, motiva in Greek words, mm -hmm. that they are used to react from the child. Because every relational pattern that uh, you are familiar with, you reenact that in the mm -hmm. adult. Okay. For mm -hmm. example, if someone of his uh, childhood has been familiarized a lot with, uh, how can I say, by playing the savor, mm -hmm. I mean, for example, if uh, he, or, for example, has a mother that was very pathetic and a father very abusive or alcoholic or something like that, probably he would have chosen to be the protector. Uh, either by being very directly protected to the, to the mother or indirectly by, and who, how can someone do that? By not bring any problems to the parents because the parents have already a lot of problems by being more neutral, more distant, more invisible in other words. So in the adulthood, probably he will continue this relational pattern by not being assertive, by saying always yes to everybody, by not expressing his feelings, by not expressing his desire, by not having not even a clue about his desires. And in a marriage, for example, he will be married with a woman. And after some years, he will understand that he didn't want that woman, but he couldn't say no. He was not, not at all attuned with his needs because mm. of this relational pattern by staying behind a protective others. And how... Uh, how he will reenact this pattern by protecting his wife by not telling her the problems of his emotions, the problems of the marriage. And he will continuously reproduce the same pattern and at the end they will break up with a very bad way, I suppose. Just a random example. So yes, in, tell me. If I understand correctly that Although we are talking about these problems, psychoanalysis doesn't, in the analysis itself, doesn't label it good or bad, or this happened or that happened, or you have to be this or that. Mm -hmm. I think it's more like being, just bringing out and letting person be aware of those mm -hmm. problems. 
if they think it's a problem. And usually in the context of therapy, people say, comes and says, I have a problem. I cannot hold any relationships. And then you start to go deeper and deeper. And then you said, can this be? And then they have to face what happened to them, which is you said, problems or these patterns of behaviors mm -hmm. or reactions happens once in if there are needs unmet for example a child needs to be loved needs to be cared mm -hmm. or child was abused and then his needs or her needs uh, weren't met this can become a problem and internalized and it becomes a pattern and they just apply it every aspect of their life mm -hmm. and Second is, is it just needs? Is there anything else into this process? This is a very difficult question, Denise, to be honest. <laughs> All the classical psychoanalysis mm. uh, discusses only about needs and desires. Mm. Mm. And impulses and drives. Mm. Says that the, the classical analysis focuses on the internal mental world of the person, of the individual, and uh, it's very focused about the desires, the needs, uh, and indeed there is not right or wrong. The classical model focuses on understanding yourself in the psychoanalysis. Hmm. But the modern, the contemporary perspectives of psychoanalysis discusses for a lot of things far beyond needs. Says we hmm. say we're saying in the contemporary model that. We don't care only about the individual desires, about conflicts, about the drives, etc. We are thinking that the most crucial and fundamental need for the person is the relational need, the need for relationship. So we are starting and we are putting in the discussion the other too, not only the individual. We are not, the contemporary always psychoanalysis, we are not understanding psychotherapy splitted by, by others. I mean that we are not understanding only the individuals. We are understanding individual always as a part of a relationship, as the half part, at least the half part of a relationship. Mm. So all the contemporary perspective tries to understand how the person, the individual relates, not what he only desires. So the focus, we're taking the focus from the individual and we are putting the focus to the interpersonal between. And that's the great shift in psychoanalysis the, the last years. We are caring about interpersonal relationships. Because psychoanalysis started as a theory that explains everything in the human psyche. Yes, in, but in, in a very individualistic way. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. it was a way to like carry off everything in terms of psychology. And mm -hmm. then that's why Freud has had many uh, different terms, mm -hmm. many different explanations. And I believe the early analysts were really trying to come up with ways to explain why things are happening. But mm -hmm. now in the modern ways, we don't really care about why it's happening or we are more interested in how could we help a person to improve a problem they think they have yes and no what do i mean hmm. uh, in the modern perspective we are the starting more constructivistically but okay. i think that the social relationship is a construction between people. So yes. we care, we care about understanding what is happening, but, but we understand what is happening through the lens of relationship. But yes, you are right. The main focus is to change some things. That's why we, you, we are using ourselves in the psychotherapy. I mean, mm. it's very simple. If we, if we all think it's very simple, it's a very simple You thing. mean we are therapists using yeah. 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 yeah, the therapeutic relationship. I, I mean, mm -hmm. that is a very simple thing. Because our primary goal is to understand the relational matrix, the relational mm -hmm. uh, pattern of the individual in the psychotherapy, in the psychotherapeutic room between, between me, me and him, we are seeing the relational pattern. We are feeling as a, the relational pattern. I can ask 
a, a client, if you want this terminology, I can ask him, why do you try to attack me right now? What did I do to you? Mm. This is the modern perspective. I'm using myself in the psychotherapeutic new room because I'm seeing, I'm understanding, I, I feel that something is happening between him and me in the psychotherapeutic room. I'm not telling to him, uh, now you have an aggressive behavior towards me because of some internal drive, because of something, or a transference, because I think that it's better to, we have to discuss about transference, some things, yes. uh, of course. Um, we understand transference very differently from the old school. In the transference, but I think that you should ask me about transference. Don't make a, a long bridge about that. Eh? No, no. I think transference is quite important. But before going to that, mm -hmm. let me see if I got it. So we are looking at the uh, relationships in a more uh, contemporary way. And the therapists or in contemporary analysis, we are using a relationship that we form with the other person. Exactly. And use that as a map in a way to see, mm -hmm. for example, let's say that I'm having a, I'm having a conversation with you and something you said disturbed me. Mm -hmm. And if this was a therapeutic setting as a therapist, I would say, if I'm feeling like this, maybe everyone else this happened, if this happens outside of therapy room, everyone else might be feeling the same. Maybe mm -hmm. this might be a problem for the person and they're not even aware of. Mm -hmm. And then you said something about transference. Can you help me? Uh, can you help us understand what is transference? And may, perhaps it will be a good to define it the way that early analysts thought about uh, transference and now contemporary approach as well. Okay, uh, transference is a concept. It's um, is a concept about that in the in the here and now, what uh, when it's happening something between a client, uh, no, between two persons, in daily life as well, there is transference, mm -hmm. not only to therapy. Let's discuss about daily life. When there is uh, a relationship between two people and you see that there is a huge uh, amount uh, of emotions that we cannot explain that emotions from the real triggering, I said something to you and you were furious, for example, but I didn't say the content of what I was saying, it was nothing provocative, nothing assaulting or something like that. So all the emotions that you are giving back to me are coming from something from the past. Mm. I mean that the words of for me, something triggered inside you, a trauma from the past, and you reacted very intensively on that. And all this amount of emotions uh, really have nothing to do with me and the real time the in vivo process between me and you, but I rem I reminded you something unconsciously. I reminded you someone, not something, unconsciously, and you reacted on that. For example, um, what kind of example can we create right now? Um, if if I was uh, in a house uh, as a child and nobody could uh, uh, leave me speak, uh, talk, I, I was all the time... When I was trying to say something, always they were telling me, no, it's not, you are very young, go to your room, etc., etc. If now I want for Denise to, to finish my phrase and you said, uh, can I interrupt you? This can I interrupt you probably will trigger my childhood and I will be furious on you. So not uh, as an example, of course, not really. Because I all the amounts of emotions from the past could come in the here and now between me and you. Because mm. the, this phrase, can I interrupt you, will remind me, not remind me consciously, but unconsciously, will make me feel neglected, will make me feel that you I'm not necessarily here, that you don't respect it, this kind of stuff. So all my emotions, my, my emotions that will uh, throw back to you are coming from the past, not from real time. This is the classical concept of transference. That's why we call it transference. It comes mm -hmm. from the past. Okay. On the contemporary perspective, we believe transference, of course, because there is, it's a phenomenon that is coming, but 
were very careful about that. What can I say? I don't want to confuse you with a lot of, um, you know, academic uh, stuff. But if you remember, I told you before that the contemporary perspective places therapist in the relationship, that it's mm. something between me and you. We cannot understand each other outside of the relationship. The, the contemporary psychoanalyst is not an observer. At the past, the classical models, let me say that, the classical therapy is an observer. That means that I observe you in the therapy and whatever you do, it's a projection on me that I am a screen, blank screen, we call it. You have heard the uh, terminology blank screen and the client projects on us his emotions, his desires. So what is happening inside of the client is projected on me. We don't think that in the contemporary perspective. We are not observers. We are not blank mm. screens. We are active participants. And as the phrase says, I recreate, I reconstruct and I co-construct with you the therapy. So in transference, if something is provoked on you, probably I will have played some role on that. Unconsciously. The therapist will have unconscious too. Eh? We are humans. Eh? Don't put the blame on me. I'm a human after all. <laughs> eh? Don't put the blame yeah. on me. So I'm only human after all. Let's mm. say the song right. So sometimes something of me uh, was, uh, was spoken uh, wrongly, was spoken intensively, was spoken uh, in a bad timing. And I, I provoked some feelings to you. And that's why the transference appear. I mean, to, to make the long story short, to be understandable, the problem with the contemporary perspective is that it, the transfer is very complicated. Me as a contemporary psychoanalyst, I have to distinguish which part of the transfer comes from me and which comes from you. Right? So it's very different the complicated thing, but it's more real. I don't know. It's more vivid, more active, something like that. I prefer that way of working. I remember during supervision, you used to make us, uh, when we describe what's happening and then asking for your advice or your opinion with our clients, you used to say, I know, I know this transference and you used to open songs. Yeah, yeah, that's and my we, personal hobby. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, we used to listen the song and they said, you see this song? describes your client's emotions. So mm -hmm. in a way, maybe you didn't say it in that way, the way that I learned transference from you mm -hmm. in really basic level, it's the communication of emotions, communication of uh, feelings from one person to another. And mm -hmm. I often say, you know, communication doesn't have to be spoken and we don't have to say many things for example we make a phone call with our moms with our partners with our children from one word they said we know what kind of a mood they are in we know and then we said what happened you know mm -hmm. so emotions are passing to us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and now you're saying that the old analysts they used to think that they're blank you know the white pebble yeah. on a screen yeah. Which is tremendously difficult, isn't it? Because kind of impossible, it sounds like. I think it's possible. I think it's possible. I mean that they have some, some right. I mean, as much neutral as a therapist, mm. you are, the most um, uh, good therapy you can provide because you are offering a free space for the client to project his fantasy, his desires. Okay, that's for sure. But in I repeat, in the modern world, it's very difficult to be neutral. For example, I don't believe that uh, not even one of uh, the modern people before going to a therapist have not seen the site of the therapist or the Instagram or, the, I don't know, mm -hmm. the TikTok, something. So my site is not neutral, it's a site. When you enter ICPAGR, you have already a transference that, that this transference is provoked by the site, right? The way that we present ourselves is of course. 
So the, what we wear, what we say, the for example, to me, there are books on behind. Yeah. Uh, there, so, are, there are classical degrees. <laughs> so there, <laughs> so are de degrees. there are degrees. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Everything is part of transference. So transference is how we interpret what we see and what we feel. Yes, it's an unconscious communication, as like you said before. Hmm. So it's very difficult for me to be neutral. We're going to the congresses. We're uh, delivering uh, lessons to a university. A, lo a lot of stuff like that. The mm. majority of my clients, they have seen me sometimes before, even through the internet, through a word, through a podcast, something. Mm. So we're not saying, because I want to be clear with that, we're not saying the contemporary psychoanalyst that it's a bad thing to be neutral. No, it's a good thing to be neutral. We're saying that it's very difficult to be neutral. So we have to have in mind the complexity of the situation and to resolve that in the therapy. For example, if someone comes and say, I saw you from the site, Helipak, I can ask, okay, did you like the site or not? This is an opening of a dialogue, mm -hmm. a great opening of the dialogue. But again, I'm just thinking what you said. Is this you asking for validation or asking, for example, uh, is this you looking for uh, more feedback or is this you want to make sure the way that you present is understood with your client? Yeah, or yeah. is this just you trying to understand how your client sees uh, and interprets what they saw so you can provide you know where you start your relationship. So that kind of uh, analysis that happens. Do you do you want to be honest? Of course. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm just opening the dialogue. I'm just exactly. opening the box of the conversation. And I have, you are totally right, I have to be aware as a contemporary psychotherapist, I have to be aware how difficult is contemporary psychotherapy because... If, for example, you, you gave a great example, I suppose, uh, Denise. If uh, I had a terrible fight with my uh, wife the previous uh, morning or this morning with my children, with uh, the colleagues, and I feel vulnerable and I need to feel that I am important, probably this question could have come from my need. And this is a wrong reason to do a question. We're not doing open questions to the clients for our needs. We are doing open questions to open the dialogue. So every time in a contemporary psychotherapist, because I repeat, we are active participants, we are engaging a lot with the clients, mm. we're engaging psychotherapeutically, I mean. So all the time we have to be attuned with this dilemma. This question comes from my personal need or it comes from the client or it comes from the necessity of the relationship. So there is always a three-level uh, dimension that we have to be aware in the contemporary perspective. But for example, this is something that I learned from you as well. If I'm not sure, which means I have to discuss it with my client, of which course. means that in a way, if we are projecting something, we bring it and we say, look, I told you something and I'm not sure if it's something that they're coming from me or I am responding the to your transference, which is so contemporary psychotherapist tries to be a blank page, but when it cannot, it brings it out in open to discuss and process these emotions and needs and uses transference as an agent of change. So relationship itself becomes the topic of the therapy rather than disorder or rather than you know what client wants, but mm -hmm. in a way relationship is the great source that reveals everything yeah you're totally right i have nothing else to add <laughs> on that <laughs> you're totally right the, the thing denise is to let me say differently all the supervisors at the a lot of time at the beginning of their careers they are they're having this question which is the most important question hmm. And this is the truth. I say to them, I don't know which is a more important question, but I know that it's very important to do questions. Okay. And I'm telling to them, don't, uh, don't misunderstand uh, things. A lot of people, they're asking 
not only the good question, but they are asking the good answer because we have been trained from our schools for the answers. Mm -hmm. In psychoanalytic therapy, there is not right or wrong answer and there is not right or wrong question. The, how can I say, the, the crucial factor that distinguishes good or bad answers in the open and the closed questions. If you are doing open questions, I mean that if you are promoting with your question to the client to make an exploration, to go deeper, to open a dialogue, it's a good question. If not, it's not a good question. So we don't. it's not a matter of a content exa exactly. It's a matter of context, which is more important than the content. The context, the procedure. If mm. the client feels that I am giving him the free space to explore himself and me and our relationship, etc., etc., then it's a good therapy. If I am trying to navigate client, to cancel client, to advise directly, it's not a good therapy because I'm closing the environment of exploration. This brings me a different kind of question, which is contemporary analysis. So, it, so it's a good question. <laughs> Yes, I think so. <laughs> Contemporary analysis mm. puts the emphasis on the relationship between therapist and the person. Mm -hmm. And the question of true, good or bad, mm -hmm. you know, useful or not, goes out goes out of the, you know. For a therapist, doesn't bring. Is, is this a good question? Is this a bad question? What should I do now? Rather than just focuses on the process, which must have bring people closer. Because mm -hmm. there's one thing that asking these questions could be disturbing, but mm -hmm. if you're reaching somewhere, this could also be very rewarding as well, isn't it? Yeah, but as you said, it's a matter of procedure. The procedure mm -hmm. is more crucial than everything. For example, um, if, uh, of course, I will need you to assimilate my client, inevitably. <laughs> I don't see <laughs> faces of other people. If uh, we're, uh, we were under the therapy, for example, and I was seeing that uh, you're feeling depressed, uh, if I, I ask you, are you depressed? It's a good question. It's not a bad question. Mm. Depressed. But if I want to to work more relationally, which mm -hmm. demands some sessions ago, demands to have an already established uh, established of a relationship. You cannot ask at the beginning of the therapy that. But if and only if we have some sessions, and we were feeling between us that okay, there is a good alliance in a way, I could ask that more deeply. For example, I could ask, Denise, uh, I'm wondering if it would be a good thing for you to ask you if you are depressed or to leave you decide which emotions really you have. What should I do? What do you prefer? Hmm. I'm you a lot of perspectives to work with because I'm I'm asking you, I'm seeing, I'm telling you that I'm seeing you, I notice you that you are not well, you are depressed probably. I'm saying that I'm not a god, I'm not sure that if it's a depression or something else. And thirdly, and most importantly for me at least is that i i'm saying to you that you can have plenty of emotions and it's okay mm. so i'm opening a space for a lot of possible questions for example if i ask you directly are you depressed you can say yes or no but if i'm asking you with the previous uh, example um, it's not an, uh, it's not that you have to to answer about the depression, probably you you will link my question that it's the first time for a long time that someone really understands that I have ambivalent feelings or I have a lot of feelings. And thank you for that. So it's a different way of working more emotionally, right? Mm. And this is relational psychoanalysis, right? To open the relational dialogue. This reminds me, as a trainee, I used to hate sessions when my clients doesn't talk. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. say anything. And then they're like, I'm like, how are you feeling today? And they would be like, good. Mm -hmm. like, what does good mean? I said, good means good. And then mm -hmm. I used to hate them. Now they're my favorite sessions. Yeah, of course. Of course. And 
Because you, under, you understand the silence that he hides a lot of emotions. Exactly. And I think what you were describing is something that comes with the Freud's genius, which is the free association. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a way that, you know, sometimes my clients says, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And I said, okay, let's play a game. Tell me, keep telling me things come into your mind. And they just keep giving me, I said, doesn't matter if it's relevant or not. Just tell me what comes, the words, you know, songs, whatever it is. And then they would just come into the point that they wanted to make anyway. So allowing clients to be, you know, allowing those emotions be quite beneficial and rewarding as well. Uh, as you said before, a very well-known song is The Sounds of Silence. <laughs> yes. Exactly. But we all love that song for some bizarre reason because mm -hmm. it triggers our internal freedom. A lot of times, let me say it differently again, in the daily outside life, Nobody, and really nobody, allows us to become silent or to stay silent. Everybody needs to ask, needs something to, to be said, it demands some, ex, some behaviors, etc., etc. It's mm -hmm. very rare outside someone to be just, stand by me another song, to stand by us and allow us, give us the permission to be silent, to remain silent. Okay. People, people are afraid of the silence. They cannot control the silence. They cannot understand silence. Because silence demands a huge amount of emotional investment. Silence demands from others to be very careful with us, to be attuned with us, to understand, to think, to be very protective, etc., etc. So, silence demands much more relational dynamic than the non-silence. But I stay on this topic because otherwise it's very academic and very easy. But yeah. Mm. When we are silent, thoughts become alive, I feel. And then when thoughts become alive, all the emotions that is bothering us becomes mm -hmm. really evident and it's an uncomfortable feeling especially if you're in front of someone and you become vulnerable you become you know you become a, like a target do, do you want to play a game we won't but just <laughs> if we remain <laughs> both of us silent for some minutes let's see what Ellen Giorgio Martin and Desmina will do <laughs> if we become silent they will do something right yeah I re I remember once I had a session. My client doesn't didn't want to talk. We spent forty five minutes mm -hmm. in complete silence. And I said, "Our time is up. Will I see you next week?" My client said, "Yes." So mm -hmm. it's a good way, you know. It's a good way to see and make meaning. I think it was the one of the best sessions we ever had. The mm -hmm. silence has a big power. Mm -hmm. By the way, there's a point that I want to go back because part of today's topic was also about relationships and you talk about the relationships that we have and transference, especially in therapy and analysis. Mm -hmm. But transference and our needs also determines our relationship with others, like lovers, like partners, like our children as well. Mm -hmm. So Perhaps transference also is the main factor we make decisions to choose our partners as well, is it? Well, not exactly only transference, but a lot of subconscious um, decision-making procedures. It's, mm. more the it's more the how familiar we are with some relational uh, patterns, as we discussed before. Um, for example, if uh, me as a child, uh, I was having a mother that all the time was uh, wanting to take care of me and she was overprotective, as it's a classical Greek uh, mother, for example, uh, then it would be very, very difficult not to be engaged with a woman that wants to cook a lot, wants to take care of me a lot, 
probably I will be, I will flirt women that for some reason, without knowing, but so, for some reason, I will have been connected with their desire to take care of me, to leave their, their needs behind, not to work a lot, to spend a lot of time with me, to put myself as a priority for their lives. The, the content of the transference or the relational pattern could change. But the context is the same. The context is that I, I am prior, prior to their lives. The context could change. Some of them could feed me a lot. Some of them could uh, stay home and uh, take care of me. Some of them will never piss me off, etc., etc. But the content is one. The, sorry, the context is one. That I will be the privileged. And that will be evoked from my previous relational pattern with the mother, that always the mother was very overprotecting, say, you're my treasure, you're my love, I am living for you, you are the only one, blah, 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 a lot of things like that. Yeah, but there are unconscious, internal unconscious mechanisms that make us familiar with specific relational patterns. That's, mm. that's it. Yeah. So there is a truth that children that the people often look for their uh, primary caregivers, like their parents, when they're choosing uh, partners. Yes, but this is the trap, the big trap. The big trap is mm. that usually if we are not under therapy, we have not made, made therapy in our previous life, not always, but the majority of the people are choosing partners how can I say it? Not because of the real need, but because of their trauma. We call it trauma bonding. Hmm. Okay. My pathological, in a way, needs strive for the reciprocal pathological need. And that's not a good thing for us. So we are not matching people uh, on behalf of our real real interest, of our, our real internal desire and needs. We're not developing ourselves, but we're choosing partners because we are familiar with specific types of partners. Oh, so trauma or something extreme as a child yeah. twists our desires and how we choose yeah. people that we get close to, which we wouldn't yeah. choose otherwise. Yeah. Is is the the difficult translation of the word thello? Hmm. Thello in Greece has two meanings: has I'm familiar with, which is the trauma body, or I really like, which is the appropriate matching. But the, but it's very difficult without analysis to distinguish between really like and familiar with. A joke that I'm have made for my, my clients. I'm saying to them, go to a bar, see, for example, the men that you like, and flirt with others, to be sure. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. And because I'm trying to, to persuade them, in God the word persuade, of course, to, to, to give them understand the, the difference between trauma bonding and real need bonding, right? Hmm. Which also means if someone comes to analysis and they have a trauma bonding, mm -hmm. part of the the result of the analysis might also be them, you know, breaking up. So therapy is not always about fixing things as well. The most usual uh, result is the breaking up. Yeah. Mm. And that's another reason that they are hesitating psychotherapy. The majority of the people, and this is a normal thing, I cannot accuse anybody, the majority of the people hesitate about exploring themselves. Because you, if you are, understand yourself and you see that something is not, um, really you don't like something, you have to confront a lot of things. You have to confront the past, the relationship, the your living style, probably your financial status, probably etc. etc. A lot of difficult things, but really, Denise, do you have another choice? If you do, you won't do that. A lot of psychosomatic, psychosomatic disease will come. A lot of 
you know, um, uh, self-immune symptoms will arose. I mean that your self will bring the bell mm. in, a, in, in a way. The, the modern psychosomatic uh, disorders, the Freud was from the beginning saying that, you know, body knows and body reacts. And yeah. I think he was saying nothing is by chance if there's a reason for everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This Probably. also this also makes things infinitely complex for each client, isn't it? Yes, but uh, it's very risky if we analyze over analyze everything. Some things, as Freud was saying, sometimes a cigar is only a cigar, <laughs> nothing more important <laughs> than that. Okay. Yes, some sometimes, yeah. Uh, this is another uh, mistake that the um, uh, non-experienced psychotherapists are doing. They're analyzing and over-analyzing and over-over-analyzing and over-over-over-analyzing. And I'm telling them, okay, you are right to analyze, but you have to stop to some point to live your life. Uh, and so you're not sure. It's only hypothesis. Hmm. And I, I'm using some jokes that I am, cannot say it officially here <laughs> because of the words. <laughs> uh, that reminds me that mm. I heard that really good joke. It says two psychoanalysts met in the office and they said, they each said hello to each other. And then they both thought, I wonder what did he mean by that? So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a good job. Yeah, we, we have these tensions to, to overanalyze, but this is a narcissistic need of the therapist. Eh? We are thinking that we are very important, that we are very clever, that we are very smart. Okay, yes, we are trained a lot. We have paid a lot of money and a lot of effort to, to for, mm -hmm. in our education and our training. So yes, in a way, don't uh, shoot me. We are more not clever from the average, but we are more sensitive from the average. Mm -hmm. So, yes, this is the truth. But this sense of uh, being um, the smart guy always brings a lot of problems to our daily lives. Mm. And, you know, if you study psychology, even if you're in therapy for some time, then mm -hmm. you're, or you're a therapist, you're, the way that you see and interpret the world changes. And this often comes out as like, don't analyze me. Yeah. And then the people's like, am I crazy? Or people would ask, uh, you have to study me. And then every time I think, don't overanalyze, don't overanalyze, just pass just it. Yes. Because uh, yeah. if, even my clients sometimes they ask me, am I crazy? And I always tell them, yes. <laughs> Because everyone wants some kind of a validation. Yeah. The, the validation of reality is crucial for the healthy mental well-being of the client. Mm, yes. Because uh, at the majority of the cases, the parents, for some, for several reasons, they were not able to reflect the reality. They were hiding things from the children in order to protect them. They were uh, they were very angry or very tired, and they couldn't. Uh, give back emotions to children and a lot of things so uh, at plenty of the times the child has taken the sign the message uh, sorry the message that there is not the validation of reality the child was feeling something and the parent was saying that the reality was different I love you but the parent mm -hmm. will not demonstrate that for example blah 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 so the validation of reality is a crucial thing uh, and yes in this in this time, we're living in a very peculiar, very bizarre times. The, the main problem is that people have not energy and time to invest on others. Hmm. They are, in the COVID played a crucial role to that, all the anxiety, death, etc. This is probably for another podcast that anxiety, hmm. death is a very big issue. But in general, uh, if I was, uh, if a client was telling me that I want you to analyze me. Why should you analyze me? I'm crazy. I would say that the craziest thing is not to analyze our relationship. That's mm. why we're here. This is the craziest thing. I don't want to analyze you. I want to analyze our relationship. Mm. In a way. You you made a good point. Take 
it's expensive and it takes time as well. Mm -hmm. And in a way, the modern analysis is person fearing their problems, which means going to therapy, it's not like going to a doctor, getting better, it can also mean, you know, feeling really uncomfortable, negative emotions are coming out, you know, trying to understand and do things could be quite confusing for a person as well, is it? Yeah, it's confusing. It, it's difficult, the word confusing. If we open the dialogue, nothing is confusing. If we don't open the dialogue, everything is mm. confusing. The confusion li li lies on the fear about exploring. That's what I'm trying to, to give as a message today. If we well, are... Can you tell that again, please? Confusion? Confusion lies, uh, is based and is created, it is reinforced by the fear of exploring things, exploring dialogues, exploring relationships. Mm -hmm. If we are willing to explore ourselves, this is nothing confusing. It's something that I'm not confused, but I don't know everything about me, but I want to know. So this is not a confusing thing. It's permanently confusing. That's, the, that's my understanding about therapeutic confusion in a way. We we spoke about many things today. We spoke about, you know, the basic what is psychoanalysis. We talk about transference. We talk about conscious and subconscious. Uh, we talk about parents, repressed emotions. We talk about uh, relational patterns. Relational patterns. And as more importantly, we talk about how modern psychoanalysis emphasize the relationship between therapist and uh, the person uh, the, and the client. But in a way, psychoanalysis doesn't have to be, it's also, it's an exploration. It's more something philosophical, I might. I dare say, you know, about looking at the life, looking at themselves, looking at meaning. And one thing that I noticed in the outside of the clinical practice, modern uh, psychoanalysis also became part of the art and culture as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, even the modern uh, analysts like Lacan and other people and what they're saying in the movies and I start to I start to see people are having cinema clubs and schools. They are using psychoanalysis to find patterns of meaning. So, as well, how about our personal lives? You know, should we use should how can we use psychoanalysis in our daily life? After a lot of psychotherapeutic experience, if uh, some, a client comes and is under psychotherapy, psychoanalytic psychotherapy, after some time, he incorporates, he internalizes the procedure mm. unconsciously. So this unconsciously and internalization of the psychoanalytic thought can easily be applied to the external real life. Otherwise, if he tries to do it consciously at the very first months of the psychotherapy, he or she will face a lot of problems because real life demands a more delegated application of psychoanalysis, more district mm. in a way. But yes, the procedure is internalized and unconsciously is repeated in the uh, on the outside life. That's for sure. So application of psychoanalysis requires person to go through extensive analysis for some time to be able to understand the process first. Of course, yeah. to understand and to experience, not to understand cognitively, because understand, understanding has a cognitive element, to experience, mm. uh, yeah. to, to be uh, viomatica in Greek we call it, uh, to, le to learn it by, uh, by experience. Uh, and this, and this experience will, I repeat unconsciously, be reenacted outside. For example, a lot of clients of mine, they are in their uh, uh, jobs. They are playing therapists and they are understanding others better. And they are helping people. 
in their job mm. or in their family or their, their spouse, etc. Of course. By the way, I would like to encourage uh, the New York College psychology students, if you have any questions, feel free to write them to chat. We, just, we are almost out of time, but I think we have uh, mm -hmm. a couple of minutes to answer if you have any questions. But meanwhile, do you have anything that you wanted to talk about today and I didn't have? A chance to ask yet? Um, as uh, Bion said, a uh, very well known uh, psychoanalytic uh, theoretician and, and practitioner of the past, the best um, way to enter to, to a session is uh, without any desire. Hmm. To be more, to be open, you know, with mindfulness, to be open within a mindfulness way. The other. So no, I didn't came today, Denise, uh, by by having some kind of specific agenda. I love the conversation. This mm, is me too. I think this was quite uh, educational at the same time, fascinating. Mm. And I wonder if our viewers will see it in that way as well. So I'm just wait a second. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I allowed to chat. Yes, I did. So it looks like we don't have questions and I would like to thank you for your precious time. I know you've been super busy and then graciously help us uh, without the, the uh, being the first participant of uh, uh, mental health talks uh, for the New York College. Mm -hmm. And if, Anyone wants to? Know? I think Martina. Martina sent the message. I think I'm not so sure. Oh yes. Does modern psychoanalysis still believe that the self defense mechanism cannot be changed in adulthood? I wonder if they believe that. Ever. Let Let me see because I didn't understand the question. I can see the chat, right? Yes, just, I think so. Just a minute to see it. Does modern psychoanalysis still believe that the self defense mechanism cannot be changed? No, of course, of course, we can change, but we're not working internally in the, uh, as a person. We're working through relationship with that defense mechanism. We're working the defense mechanism, Martina, uh, interpersonally in the room. For example, if someone's let me use the previous example with the emotional isolation. If I see a client in the room very, uh, how can I say, to, to react cognitively, to rationalize a lot, I could, uh, when I say something difficult for him or on behalf of him, and I see in the room that my, his emotions are totally neutral, I could say, uh, is that happening or, or I didn't understand well? I told you something difficult, but it didn't seem, it seems that it didn't pass on you. It, you didn't provoke any emotions. Is that right? So I'm trying to work the defense mechanisms of emotional isolation in the therapeutic relationship. So I prove in a way to him that this defense mechanism exists because I am the witness. I see the mechanism, defensive mechanism in the room. He cannot say no, I said, but I told you that you don't care about if your mother would die, for example, and you are very calm. So how is that happening? Why well, you're not angry with me, for example. So we're working through the relationship. So instead of saying you have a defense mechanism, it's like, look, it's happening right now between yeah. you and me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Can you also tell us a little bit about the process of change in this? How does change happen? That Okay, you pointed out. Mm -hmm. And then how does change come? How does person, let's say, okay, I have a defense mechanism. How do they change? You should know all my secrets from one podcast. <laughs> but, but in general, when you are uh, um, reflecting on the client, mm -hmm. the relational pattern, the a lot of times, several times, continuously in the here and now between you and him, etc., etc. Then the unconscious of the client starts to doubt the necessity of the defense mechanism. 
For example, if I am telling to the client difficult things, but as I should be as a therapist, of course, I'm not attacking him or I'm not aggressively asking, I'm just reflecting, the unconscious in a time should um, say something like, okay, Dimitris is not a threat. Why others should be threatful? I see. Not, not so simplistically as I say, but just as a first narrative. Yeah, the continuous confrontation of the defensive mechanism uh, is happening in the therapeutic room through the live experience of the relationship. So the defense mechanisms gradually are becoming to, to fade out because the unconscious understands that the person does not need these defenses more. It's not so easy or not so simple as it sounds, but mm. it gives you a general idea. So you're saying is once you are close enough with your client and your mm -hmm. client realizes that you have no, there is nothing for you to gain to just accuse them something. It's just, yeah, this is something happened between us. I'm just pointing out. And if client realizes it and this happens enough time, in a way it says, you know what? With him, I don't need this defense mechanism. Something and like that, that, yes. Possibility of not using defense mechanism mm -hmm. appears, and then that person can start applying outside of therapy room. In other words, I think we should close with a poetic way because today it's, it's the global day of poetry. You know that. It's the day of Is poetry. It? Yeah, yeah. It's the day of poetry today. It's like saying to someone, when you are under a fight, the armor saves you from the enemy. But after the fight, if you don't get rid of your armor, this armor will kill you because of the weight. And now mm -hmm. we're not in fight. Understanding. You were in, in the fight you were years ago during your childhood. Not now, but you are thinking that we are in fine constantly. So you are having the armor on you 24-7 and you will be drawn by the weight of your mm. armor. Thank you for today and thank you for uh, your experiences and joining us and sharing them with us. Uh, it is a pleasure every time that I speak with you, I learn new things. Every time I am with you, new perspectives comes in and hopefully if you like we can also do this again maybe we can also talk about some specific topics uh, of, course. of course i think it would be quite interesting for uh new york college students and the uh, people that watch uh, through youtube we could all learn a lot more from you we will arrange something thank you for the much for the invitation mm -hmm. I hope that this series of uh, uh, podcast or uh, uh, lectures will go well. I'm sure that will go well. I know you and you are, I, I can see how you develop constantly, Denise. Uh, oh, thank a lot you. Of different areas. Thank you very much. And uh, if someone has uh, questions, you could mail me, get, uh, get into my site and find the, the ICPA email and you could mail me if you have some other questions. Thank you very much for today. Thank you for your time and see you later. And thank you all for joining us. And thank you for the New York College Psychology Club students and people who watch through internet. We will hopefully be back with different topics. <laughs>